Welcome to the Sunset Safari. Uh, my name is Brent Joe Smith. I have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera. We have Jamie and Viam out on foot. And uh, it was a troubling morning for all of us this morning. We were unable to deliver big cats, even though we had tracks. So Andrew and I have made our way up to the northwestern corner, seeing if we possibly might spot where the lions might have crossed. If we have no luck here, we're going to shoot down to where Karula had a diker kill. So hopefully we get a little bit of luck. And also in final control, we have Kirsten and Nigella. But right in front of us, we have some zebra. So quite a nice little group. It's a group we've seen a few times before. With two foals. I'm just going to I sort of try. Oh, no, we're not going to slide. Perhaps. I'm just going to slide in next to them. And this female here on the back is one I saw the other day. She's got those remnant claw marks on her behind. Quite an old injury. Possibly from lions. There we go, there you go. The rest on the little foals about to, on the little foals about to cross the road in front of us. Now for the worst joke of the evening. There is a zebra crossing. I can see yeah, Andrew shaking his head behind me. That's that sub-adult who we saw sleeping so heavily on quarantine the other day. So obviously very chuffed with this nice new grass that that little bit of rain has brought out. Munch, munch, munch. And no two zebras have the same spots, or stripes, sorry, um, like a leopard. They are completely unique, each every, and every individual. So on this particular type of zebra, the Birchills or plain zebra, it's a very distinct, almost shadow stripe that you get between the very dark stripes. So if we have a back look there, you can see the very dark stripes, and you have a slightly lighter stripe often in between those are called shadow stripes now in most zebra species are related but there are a few different species we have the birchels or plain zebra in a few different subspecies and forms throughout sort of the bush fault and plains of africa we also get a cape mountain zebra and a hartman's mountain zebra and there's one other zebra species still left and that lives in northern Kenya and I wonder who knows what zebra that is if you know pop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on Twitter so let's get this afternoon safari going and we are live from Juma private game reserve in search of lions and leopards but we're definitely not going to annoy ignore the other beautiful animals that surround us like zebra and some impala just beyond Welcome to Matt Shift Runner, who's a new viewer. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Sunset Safari. Matt would like to know, do we have a Twitter account? We do. The Twitter account is um, at Wild Earth. Uh, but we're also on Facebook, at, which is just Safari Live. Uh, but the hashtag Safari Live, if you want to get a message through to us on Twitter, is the best way possible. If you're on Twitter, otherwise, just pop us an email. So just double checking over that area that Scotty and I went through yesterday. I uh, mean, sorry, this morning, looking for those lion tracks. Sure, it seems like it was ages ago. Just making sure there are no tracks we might have missed in that very dark morning. Can you see this 
these prominent elephant paths that crisscross this area, and these are regularly used by a lot of the predators. Nice highways, so to speak. on safari shortly so we'll probably hear him on the radio a little bit later so for those of you who are new all the safari vehicles ours and the, the properties we're all connected via radio to try and make it as easy as possible for all of us to find animals so curious one saying hopefully there's a freaking herd of buffalo that might attract the lions i hope so too section Scotty and I didn't check yesterday, uh, this morning so we ducked off there. I'm hoping this is not where they managed to sneak across. tracks. Andrew, are you looking, checking that side? Yes. Good man. So I'm thinking if they had that buffalo kill on our neighboring property, the closest water for them would have been around here. Uh, and now we have found an animal that reminds me a lot of Andrew. So if you want to know what a kill looks like. Here we go, vervet monkeys. Looking like they're up to mischief. But one thing about a vervet monkey, it is one of the best alarm systems in the bush. They have incredibly good eyesight and are great predators. So when you hear a monkey alarm calling, it's always a very good idea to have a much closer look than you would for some. While we check the, our northern boundary for tracks, let's go to Jamie, who's on the pony. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the bushwalk portion of this sunset safari. Bushwalk, you may ask, then why are they driving on the Mahindra? Well, we're following up on those leopard tracks that we had this morning. So Brent was trying to help us find them. It was a male and a female that walked in from our southern boundary from Gauri, Maine, and wandered through across Ledwood and into Juma. Our Brent was helping us track on foot while we were driving around on Rusty. The male, it looks like the male crossed out towards Torchwood, but the female remains an unknown quantity, last seeing disappearing into the block that I'm heading to now. And just to give you a rough idea about the challenges that somebody of my stature faces, <laughs> I'm busy driving the Mahindra. Now Brent is probably sits about a foot higher than me. I actually really am finding it very difficult to see over the steering wheel. It just makes tracking a little bit more difficult. And next time I've got to remember to bring my booster seat with me. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not the shortest person in camp and some of them actually struggle to reach the clutch. At least I don't have that particular struggle. But yes, VM and I will be out and about on bushwalk this morning, or this afternoon. And we're going to see if we can follow up on that leopard on foot. And of course, your intention when we're acting on foot like this or 
oh, 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 is to avoid things like that. Shame, so first still here. Hello, hippo. Oh dear, I'm going, don't go that way. Please don't go that way. I want to go that way. A bit more relaxed than it was yesterday or the day before when we bumped into it. I'm gonna back up and give it some space so that it can come back to its pan. I wonder why it's chosen to be here. And what the deal is there. I was actually going this route to avoid going through a dip and losing your signal. But I'm kind of glad that I did, just so that we know that this hippo is around. It didn't look like there was a hippo in the Juma pan. There we go, I've given it a bit more space. Nice and relaxed. I'm giving it space purely for the animal's sake, so that it doesn't feel terribly threatened. Now usually when a hippo is in water, that's when it feels at its absolute safest. And it's only when they are caught out of water, usually with you between it and a safe escape, that they become very volatile and particularly aggressive and dangerous. Now in this case, unfortunately with this drought, no way! Don't go! Mating leopards! That's so cool! We can hear them, we can hear them in the drainage line. FC, you need to get Brent right over here. I'm gonna call him on the Game Drive channel. Yes, this is what we need. Brent for Jamie. I wanna say thank you to the hippo. Thank you, hippo. Yes, we have the right. We need to say thank you to the hippo. We've got audio of those ingwe in the Mulwati, just close to Spaghetti Junction. Copy, I'm uh, on the... How cool is this? I'm just making sure he knows where they are, plus trying not to reverse off the road. So exciting. Yeah, Brent, um, the only problem is there's a bubu that's just gone towards where they are again. Um, but they definitely, we might even be able to get visual from um, the junction itself in the Mulwati. So exciting! Confirm uh, the multiple yellow top route. That's affirmative. They're either in that, I think they're in that thicket between Twin Dams and the Mulwati, um, just to the south of Spaghetti Junction. So exciting! Copy, I'm on my way. So, for new viewers, welcome to Safari okay, Live, well, and you just never know when you're going to or what you're going to encounter when you're out and about like this. Yeah. Where are these leopards? It sounded like they were in the drainage line, hey, Vium? Uh, they're, right here, they're right here somewhere. Now, we spoke oh, about it this great, morning and the sound that leopards make. And when they mate, they actually, it happens very regularly. So once every two to three minutes, if they're feeling particularly enthusiastic and if it's at the beginning of their mating session. But what happens is, leopard mating, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's a very aggressive um, act. And it usually results at the end in the female turning around, the male turning around and swatting each other. And the sounds that they make go something along the lines of, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that impression. In, in the spirit of strange impressions that we've been we've been making and it's somewhere right there are somewhere right here i actually want to sit and just try and have a look across us and just sit and listen and see if we can maybe hear them but i've called brent in come on leopards the biggest problem now is of course that hippo so we can't go wandering straight in there on foot not knowing that he is there. One more. There's one thing I want to do. I've, I know that they're here, so we can actually go off road because it is for a confirmed sighting. So we're going to go and have a look. And due to the fact that we don't have to do serious damage to this particular drainage line area, we can. I want to go and just check this gap up ahead. Let's go see if we can find some mating leopards. For all VM having to balance on the dashboard, I believe that we're in for a lucky afternoon and Brent has found a leopard for you.
And so, welcome back. This is death. She's after. Um, we are just racing towards her, and there's this male leopard was walking up the road towards us. Uh, it looks to be, I know who he is. Let's see if anyone out there can guess who leopard this is. And if you know, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Big adult male. Looks like luck is on our side. I made a joke about finding big cats before we left on safari. Seems like you don't have to be a skilled tracker, you just need a little bit of lady luck. I'm located the uh, Wanuna Ingwe uh, Mobile West, Office of Cut Line just to the west of the junction with Kari Cutline. Not just yet. I'll update you as soon as I know. Andrew knows. Who do you think it is, Andrew? Mm, on it. Oh, let's see if everyone out there joining us on Safari agrees with you or thinks you might be a bit of a banana. Landed on me. So, leopards around. We've got a little forester. So, uh, leopards on the move, so let's leave them off. So, a few of you out there seem to think it could be Vula. Sorry, guys, it's going to be on the game. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me a second while I try.
Green? Yeah. Ah, it's your thing. Go pen. Red? Add signal area. Uh, as he moves towards the Tax, tax. Yeah, tax, I'm near the top of the crest um, if you're heading west from Gary Cutline Junction with Buffalo. Buffalo down the road at the moment. There we go. I've spotted him. You see how he's turned? Hey, firm. There you go. You see how this boom? Thanks, Robert. So, it is looking like it is in Vula. You can see he's losing condition. He is looking quite old. And those very distinct tattered ears. So well done to Raisa and quite a few others who got that spot on. So Steph in Switzerland says she's always amazed by a male leopard's neck. Now the reason they've got these big thick necks is protection from fighting. So it is to help. They've got extra big muscles and some extra skin there. So if they do get into a fight, some of them... Oh, listen, those could be really upset. <coughs> and so it, it protects them in those fighting. Let's start how deep in that kudu bark is. Oh, no, don't go that way, please. So he's still moving parallel to the road, so we will try to stay with him as long as possible. I really do apologize about the screen jumping in and out in this area. Unfortunately, that is just one of the things that happens. We are live in the African bush following one of Africa's big five, a big male leopard. He is sort of at the end of his tenure, I'm afraid. Uh, Tingana, who's a slightly younger male, has basically taken over the majority of his territory. And I think that's possibly um, the leopards that Jamie heard in the drainage line. And he has looked back to where Jamie, heard, oh, Jamie is looking for the leopards. And he will try to stay out of in his condition you can see he's not in the best condition so he is getting quite old now he's about 12 i think turning 13 this year which is old for a male leopard the oldest recorded male leopard in the wild is 15 years old so 12 for a male leopard out in the, in the wild is very old he's disappearing there hopefully tax or cray get you a fast I'm calling at him. Very, dis very distinct leopard behavior, heading for the closest termite mound or high ground 
where he's going to be able to get a better view of his surroundings and possible uh, potential, sorry, prey species up ahead. Just make him, you got him there, Andrew, on top of the termite mound. Look at that camouflage, isn't it incredible? Uh, maybe, let me go forward and we'll go for you. Center, you got him now? Yeah. There you go. So look at that. How incredible is that camouflage? I mean, he is 50 meters from us, and look how those rosettes just blend in. So Darlene in New Hampshire, <coughs> oh, excuse me, Darlene, is wondering whether all the big cats, lion, leopard, cheetah, are all comfortable using the roads. Uh, they are, Darlene, and I'll explain to you why in a second. So, a lot of the roads have been built on old elephant paths, so the reason the roads are put in the areas they are is to maximize the possibility, oh, he's off again, of uh, finding game. Let's just try and move forward. And Jamie, um, this thing we are heading north. Um, so we'll probably see you just now. Okay, guys, that leopard's disappeared. I'm just going to wait here to show where the uh, other guys where he went. But guess what? Jamie's found more leopards. It's incredible. Let's go have a look. Central to the west. There we go. It is just going to be one of those afternoons. Oh, so our bushwalk hasn't quite gone according to plan. And <laughs> we haven't really done any walking or at all. But we have located a leopard for you. Now, it looks like shadow to me. Where the male is, we haven't managed to spot him yet. I'm pretty sure he's probably lying up on the other side of that termite mound. So when it does come time for mating, we might have to reposition. Could be a bit tricky, we know this block of old, and it is rather an uncomfortable one to enter into, but what an awesome way to start off our afternoon. I'm currently sitting on the door so that I can sort of watch what's going on. Poor old VM is doing all of this handheld, which goes to show how incredibly adaptable our cameramen are. But what an awesome, awesome, and a big well done to VM for hearing that first sound that alerted us to the presence of the leopard. So it goes to show how interesting this is, and I wonder if this, if Karula is aware of this situation. So when a leopard like, a female leopard like Shadow, whose territory is right to the west of us around Arethusa and Simbombili, when it comes time for them to mate, it's amazing how they just follow that male wherever he may go. The fact that Brent is with Mvula suggests to me that we're probably going to be seeing Tungana as well this afternoon. How's that? Now all we need is Karula to come back and finish that Dacre kill on Buffles for Cutline and we'll have completed the family circle for this afternoon. <laughs> Who knows, we could wait for Kanuma and Quarantine to come wandering down. <laughs> it's a, it just goes to show how luck works out here. And some of it is luck and some of it is hard work. Brent and I worked very, very hard to find this leopard this morning. And then she very kindly made a lot of noise to alert us to her presence. Our hippo, by the way, did come down towards the drainage line as we were entering, entering it. So I'm glad that we didn't have to go wandering through here on foot to find them. Now, as I said, with mating leopards, it can be very varied in terms of how often they mate. And a lot of the time it's determined by the temperature of the day, as well as whether or not, or how far into their mating session that they are. So don't forget that we are coming to you live, so we just don't know what to expect. And who knows if Mbula decides to turn around and come back here and make an appearance. 
That being said, for new viewers, mating leopards is a fascinating thing. It usually lasts about five to seven days and they can copulate probably somewhere in the region of about 300 times during that time. And the reason behind this is that the female actually has what's known as an induced fertilization. So although she comes into estrus and is ready to mate, she isn't yet ready for the sperm to fertilize or to have released her ovaries or her ovums, her eggs. So what happens is the male mates with her repeatedly in order to bring that about. And that's what actually prompts that aggression that you see with mating leopards that they tend to react to each other very aggressively, particularly when the male moves off the female after he's mounted her. And the reason behind that is he has spines on his penis, which actually cause her a considerable amount of pain, but it's necessary in the entire process of the mating and induced ovulation. So that's what we're listening to at the moment, or we were listening to. I think because it's so hot and humid, she's showing a bit of reluctance. We've actually seen them, particularly with Quetile, when, he was, when she was mating with Tingana. We saw her mating roughly every two minutes. So now we just have to wait and see. Now, I know for certain she's mating because we heard it, but even then, if I were to see her here in the Mulwati, in the heart of Karula's territory, I actually think that I would expect her to be mating anyway, because it's only really then that those females start to push the boundaries into each other's territories. Since I'm here, I'm gonna sit down a little bit, make the wildebeest's life a bit easier since he doesn't have any kind of tripod. <laughs> Working under extreme conditions to bring you the footage that we have. And once Brent does arrive, then we will be able to swap All places right. with him and actually go on the walking part of this walking safari. Although at the moment, I have to be honest, I'm starting to wonder whether we might not have better signal than Rusty. I'm not sure if FC is seeing pictures in termite mounds or if they've actually spotted the male. Now, I've certainly seen termite mounds look like leopards before. <laughs> termite mounds can be very deceptive. FC, just to let you know, there is a leopard on that termite mound. There are not two. <laughs> He's seeing shapes in termite mounds. Maybe what would be a good idea for Brent is to go onto the, uh, onto the top of the bank there if he can get Rusty in. I think I'm going to try and get hold of him on the Game Drive channel and just see if we can suggest to him that he goes around that side. Come on Shadow. Now I'm really excited for new viewers who will have this as their first time watching leopards mating and the dance that the leopard does or the female does in order to attract the male's attention is one of the most intricate seduction dances in the animal kingdom and it's incredible to watch and it usually takes him about a day to actually get to the point where he is interested enough in her to mate with her probably because he does not want to waste any energy in mating with her if he doesn't think there's the possibility of fertilization. I'm just going to wait for my opportunity to just chat on the Game Drive channel. Brent for Jamie. Hello, uh, what's the exact position on the map? Just approach my um, central junction with uh, Banta. Yeah, sorry, apologies. She's actually on a termite mound on the eastern edge of the drainage line, right where it becomes, gets that steep wall at the Tambueti thicket. And I don't know whether the best approach would be to actually come from either Batalia or Mumba and approach from that block, looking down into the Mulwati. Hey, 
be hard. But you in the drainage. That's affirmative. Hello, girl. Copy, I think I'm going to take that two track that runs on the northern edge of the mighty from that to the app. So, probably how far it meters from that junction at the position. I think I'm about 200 meters along that, um, maybe a little bit more. Can you copy that? Uh, can you copy that? Sorry guys, just trying to give Brent some no, directions Brent, into sorry. the sighting. No, no, northern side of the Hawaii. Oh, well, northeastern side. Uh, between Mamba and... Oh gosh, she's looking at us. Yeah. Hello, girl. Uh, I think this is going to be... Now, for those of you joining us for the first time, you will have heard us talking regularly about a Karula. Now, as far as I can tell, and bear in mind that, especially in this current setup, I can't see exactly what you're seeing, but I'm fairly certain that this is Shadow, keeping a close eye on us, and she's quite a distinctly recognizable leopard. She's got a very short nose, or an unusually short nose to my eyes, and she's a very tiny, tiny leopard, very delicate, almost, you could describe her as. This tells us one other thing, for those of you wondering. Shadow is not pregnant. Because Shadow would not be mating with Tingana if she were. Pregnant females, to the best of my knowledge, particularly if we thought she was pregnant at the late stages, they do not mate with males. Is she going to get up? She's looking upwards. Just one more opportunity to go onto the Game Drive channel. Craig, just so you know, the best visual is from the drainage line itself. I just think that the my daughter's on the other side of the termite mound, so she might move over to him. And confirm that's on the northern, I mean the, the eastern bank. That's affirmative. I've got no visual of him. Alright, uh, I'm heading east along Mamba. I'll try the eastern bank first, and my luck I will come down back to the branch line. Copy that. Thank you ever so much. Brent, I've also just realised we went past one of those little drainage lines, so it might be difficult for you to cross from the Batalier side. I, mean, I know that. I've got a spot to cross that. Um, I know that drainage line. Copy, Perf. Awesome. Brent always has a way through drainage lines that people never imagined were actually possible to get through. Ah, that, that would explain it. VM agrees. So I'm looking at her, now bear in mind that I can't see exactly what it is you're seeing. And I'm looking at her thinking, she looks like Shadow, but she doesn't look like Shadow. And I've been trying to work that yeah, out yeah. from while I've been sitting here. And the fantastic news is that this is actually a leopard that I have never seen before. Raisa, I agree with you. And Nikki, actually, who's also put it out there as an option. We think this is Tundi. So how cool is that? Tundi is Shadow's sister, one of Karula's other daughters. And for me, this is a first. Viam, is this your first? It's Viam's first time seeing Tundi as well. So this is absolutely epic. Yeah, I'm so excited about this. There's nothing like seeing a new animal. And if that definitely suggests to me that she is mating with a male here. I wonder who the male could be. Because I heard rumours that Tundi was mating with another male around here. So maybe we might even get to see more than one new leopard this afternoon. The story just gets better and better and better. She's showing a bit of reluctance though. She hasn't actually moved from her post yeah, on the termite probably. mound. So she might, might take us a while to figure out who the male is. You're just gonna have to stay tuned and find out with the rest of us. This is awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> so Tundi, you're a dark horse and a surprise. And Paul Rizzo, absolutely. Awesome Leopard Friday is the way forward. 
we've had Mvula and Tandi in the space of less than an hour. Nope, she's getting up to go. I think this is where we're going to get the audio. So listen closely. I can't get to reposition to where she's going to move to. She's going to go and seduce him. We might see flashes of her dance. Yeah, those deep rumbling purrs. Sorry, just stand by. Oh, unfortunately, we can't see more than the odd flash of motion. Did you guys hear that? No, didn't come through, unfortunately. We're not close enough. It sounds a little bit like two Harley Davidsons getting started up. I'm just gonna give Brent some more directions and we'll see if we can get him up there. I can't get this Mahindra up to that particular spot. Brent, Jamie. Adrian, I got that audio. Confirm you lost vision of him. That's affirmative. They're now um, on the eastern side at the top of the ridge. I can't see them from where I am. I copy. I'm in that position. Uh, confirm you've got my vehicle audio. That's affirmative. Yeah, I've got them. Well done. There we go. And that's what we wanted. And that is teamwork at work. Brent has made his way in. He says he has spotted them. He's just currently positioning Rusty so that we can go and have a look from the perspective of the top of the ridge and get an idea as to exactly what's happening and who that male is. And I'm as excited as you are to discover who it might be. So we await patiently and let's go over to Brent and find out who it is. To creep through the bush up above Jamie. So we all, we were with the leopards, Jamie's below in case they hasn't, I don't recognize this female. Oh, there we go. Jamie's just let me know. It's Tundi. Um, and we can't see the male clearly yet. There they are. Look, it's in Ghana. There we go. Isn't she wonderful? Another one of Karula's kids, so to speak. Listen to that audio. Hello, madam. Nice to meet you. So, look at that. I know they've just mated. It's normally about 15 minutes, but she might mate again. Oh, look at that. That is leopard flirting at its finest. showing very much interest at all. Isn't this fascinating, guys? Brain coming, brain. So that is leopard floating at its finest. Sorry, guys, I just got to be on the radio for a second. Stanley White Craig. Uh, Brent, confirm uh, there's a route in off Bachelor. Hey, from Craig, just follow my tracks. There's an old two track from an old line sighting. Uh, there is a small drainage line. Just stand by one. Look at this, guys. It's gonna, they're gonna mate again. <laughs> Look at that. Is that fantastic? So, leopard mating is very, very aggressive. Um, 
and this means the mate they just started mating that they're mating so frequently look at her she's now going to roll onto her back like that so i mean she's right in front of the vehicle and often you'll notice after copulation she'll do that to try and make sure none of the semen falls out and this will happen sort of every 15 minutes on average Ooh, just like your mother and your sister And isn't that incredible? She's hissing right at us. And that's very similar to what Shadow does sometimes, and even Krula. So we haven't moved. We're not doing anything. Uh, but they are obviously in heightened sort of hormones at the moment. I've just got to chat to Craig quickly. I'll be back with you in a second. Look at that. She's no more than three feet from the vehicle right next to us. Yeah, Craig, if, um, if you come off Batelier right down near uh, the, the drainage line, you'll see there's a pan there that's got a couple of mnisi lying in it. And if you just keep coming past, follow my tracks, there is a, a sort of rock a bridge that crosses through over that little drainage line. And then you'll get my visual just after you cross that little drainage line that flows into the Marty. Um, Thank you. Isn't that amazing, guys? So there he is. And you can see that. What? Look at that. She's still snarling at us. Sorry, Andrea. I know you're on the mail at the moment. But she's lying there just very relaxed and suddenly giving us a good hiss. So this is the first time I've ever seen this leopard. And so, I know our viewers who've been watching for a long time, who can give me some info on her? How old is she? I know she is one of Karula's progeny, but um, from what litter, she possibly, I think I vaguely remember her being Shadow's sister. So, I, th I think if I remember correctly, she is Shadow's sister. So... You can see a slight similarity in their face, but in their colouring, she's much darker uh, than Shadow. This is really, really interesting. And it, we were, we, I know I've been chatting about recently the fact that leopards will actually move out of their natal territories. And to mate now natal territory is their home range where they stay permanently so when a female comes into Easter she will actively seek out uh, all the possible males that her cubs might come into contact with to mate with them so if they ever come across those cubs they're all convinced that they're the daddies so it's a defense mechanism a very smart one so that's why it's near impossible to know whether female or whether the fathers of the cubs exactly who they are without doing genetic tests so as far as i know tandy is normally much further to the southeast towards cheetah plains in Texas, Tandy's cub, current cub is over a year and a half and it is a female. So female cubs become independent at a lot earlier age than males. Sorry guys, Craig's just trying to call me. Okay. And so they become independent from anywhere from a year to a year and a half. So it would definitely be time to mate again. And I'm not sure what her new cub or her cub's name is, but what we can do is Craig, who's from that part of the world, is on his way to join us in the sighting, so he might have some more information on that cub, so I'll ask him as soon as he gets here. So I'm excited. You hear that click, click, click? That's just my camera shooting away. Uh, always amazing to see a leopard you haven't seen before. They're such exquisite creatures.
and you can see the vast difference in size between a male and a female leopard. And Katja just says, wow, he's enormous compared to her. He is a lot bigger than her. And he's actually sleeping with his head on a log at the moment, being quite lazy. So we do know there's another vehicle about to join us in this sighting. So I'm going to scoot forward slightly, and we can also get a better view of him. Now, I know I've been telling you guys a lot about how to drive around elephants recently. A lot of the same principles work with a leopard. So don't move as soon as you've started your car. Let the car run for a few seconds, let them get used to it. And again, low range, especially now that they're mating. You can see she's watching the tires, but she hasn't, her ears haven't gone flat. Um, she's, her tail's not flicking. for a while but i do know the other game drives are coming so we want to make sure we position so the other game drives can also get a great view as i was saying you can see she's quite a bit darker than her sister wouldn't you agree andrew mm. now this is always going to be a controversial question but guys who do you think is prettier tandy or shadow uh, if you would like to let me know, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So you're going to hear me clap my hands a little bit quickly, and that means I'm just switching off the virtual reality rig, which is that ball of GoPros on the front of the vehicle. And amazing that we managed to catch that on virtual reality. So that's going to be amazing. Very exciting stuff. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Didn't mean to do that. Yeah, it seems the GoPro noise stopped them. And you can see, if we have a look at the mail, Now, we've seen two male leopards today, and that's not two big male leopards, and that's not something you see every day. And you can see, look at his ears, look at his face. He looks in a lot better condition than the male we saw earlier. The male we saw earlier is Mvula, and this is Tingana. Gerard was just asking, and uh, Mvula, in his prime, was a, a decent-sized male leopard, but still not nearly as big as Tingana or Anderson. Uh, Tingana, if you just look at that neck, you can see how much bigger his neck is uh, than Mvula. And when he stands, he's definitely quite a bit taller. This looks like he might have spotted something behind us. Oh, here comes the flirting again. Confirm, Craig, keep going. Confirm, the Moati. and then they'll probably about 60 meters from the Moati, there's a, a spot to cross over this little drainage line that flows into the Moati. We're just on the eastern or south, southern, southern side of that. Look at that, here comes the leopard flirting again. Male leopards often show great disdain. And the female often has to almost irritate them. Listen to how deep that growl is. Look at that hissing afterwards. So the reason 
Um, there's so much aggression in leopard mating is because the male's penis is barbed, so it actually hurts. And when these copulations are this aggressive, it's generally very early on in the mating. So this probably might be the first day of mating, and also the fact that they're mating far closer than 15 minutes. It's going to give us a snarl for good measure now. So just a, a quick little message from the wonderful Jamie who found these leopards. She says she's extremely jealous and regrets her decision to walk immensely. I'm sorry, Jamie. Andrew and I did say we had a good feeling about cats today, didn't we, Andrew? Mm-hmm. Mating between big cats can often go on for four or five days. And the males are very tired at the end of it. So, X Ranga would like to know about the distinguishing marks on Tandy. Uh, I don't know any just yet, but her left-hand spot pattern is a three. So in most researchers utilize the last line of spots above the whiskers. So we can see there, hers, she's got three really nice big dark ones as she turns her head perfectly for us. Um, on the left, I can't see the right yet. I should have a photo there. And it looks like she's a 3-3. Three, three. Looks like the right is also a 3. Now, what's going to be very interesting that sometimes in these situations is that Karula, who this is the part of the core of her territory, will sometimes come and have a look. And we've seen that before. Stephanie would like to know whether Tandy is smaller than Karula. I would say they're probably similar sized. I wouldn't say they're, they're too small. Standing by, Craig. Uh, Brendan, will be able to make it through that uh, little sheep line. Uh, is there possibly another route you might know of? Confirm you've got to the, the rocks are. That's good. I've seen your tracks going over. Um, but I think it's good to keep uh, all Ah, copy. Um, you could try from, from Mumba. Uh, I'm not sure how thick the block is from that side. Though. I've, I've never really been too far beyond in a vehicle from where I am now. Okay, copy. Um, if you, when you drive down the Moati, you will, you'll get my vehicle visual. You won't be able to see them, but so just so you have an idea of exactly where we are. He's just trying to get his way in here, and unfortunately, his his car is a little bit long, and that is one of the joys of these little vehicles we use. They are short wheel based, so we are able to go through steeper areas uh, and between tighter corners than the guys in the bigger vehicles are able to do. It's what makes them quite ideal for what we do.
So, Billy Joe's let me know that Tandy's original name was Seca, and uh, very, very exciting for a lot of the, the viewers who've been watching since the first live drives to see her again. Uh, Billy Joe see, says that uh, Tandy was Karula's favourite between her and Shadow. Uh, Billy Joe, I'm, I'm, I hate to say this, but I, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think leopards have favourites with their cubs. I think the personality of the different individuals might come through. So you probably find why. I know Shadow was often was the more retiring of the two cubs. So the fact that she might have been seen a bit more often with Karula, uh, it's not the case that she was a favourite. She it would have been just the personality, uh, with Shadow being slightly more retiring than 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 Tandy. Uh, it's very easy to put human sort of concepts onto to wild animals, uh, but uh, it's often not the case. It's what we would like to believe rather than what is the truth that's happening in front of us. So we saw in Vula a little bit earlier, um, actually while we were rushing to give Jamie a, a hand in this area, and uh, Terry in New York would like to know how far is Mbula from here. He's not too far, uh, probably about two and a half kilometers as the crow flies, uh, but he can definitely hear this. I could see him looking back this direction and he kept moving away. So uh, although he would love obviously to spread his genes some more, he's not gonna risk taking on a leopard that's in, in such great condition as Tingana. So there comes Craig, let me just let him go. Craig, I'm above you now. Copy. That's Tangana and Tandy. she's a new leopard but I am I am quite quite liking her at the moment I definitely do prefer the darker leopards to the to the lighter colored ones so interesting enough where I worked in the southern Sabi sands there was a quite a distinct lineage of leopards as you want to call it um, between the river female and the old uh, mother leopard as they used to call her and now Tandy sort of sits halfway between in the color scale but so uh, the mother leopard which was in the south of the property. They were much paler uh, and had more sh short squat faces. Uh, and then the river leopard seemed to be much darker, almost more jaguar colored than, uh, than the other leopards. And I've always had an affinity for the darker colored leopards. And everyone's got their own personal preferences. But I do think, actually I'm not gonna say it yet. I haven't heard what you guys think. Who's, pretty, who's more pretty, Tandy or Shadow? Uh, Tingana is a beautiful big boy and you can see he's also got that one of the darker darker colors so compared to the Anderson male he is Tingana is much much darker so Stephanie says Tandy's prettier Stephanie I'm tending to agree with you also looks like she's got a little bit more attitude and for those who've been watching for the last year or so while I've been around uh, we all know how I like a leopard with attitude Hence my favorite being of the young males being Konyuma. So it shouldn't be too long, possibly before the next copulation. They will quite often 
not eat for these four or five days while they're mating, only drink water, and quite often it's the male who will try to get away from the female. But I'm just going to move the vehicle slightly um, just now. Mercedes was wondering when hunting and eating happens, and I was Mercedes uh, after the mating, but uh, that's normally f no, short as three days, as long as five days, and normally on average around f four days. <laughs> now what was that for? She does have slightly similar facial features to Shadow. So Mercedes would like me to spell a Tandy's name. So Tandy is actually short, Mercedes, for Tandekile, which means the one that is loved. So it's T-H-A-N-D-I, Tandy, love or liked, um, but it will be a shortening of uh, the Shanghai and Zulu name, Tandekile, uh, which means the one that is loved. Most of the sort of initiation of the mating is done by the females, but we'll be keeping a close eye on what's happening here. While we do that, let's go and jump across to the wonderful and very clever Jamie who actually found these leopards for us, who is finally, after a leopard deviation, on foot. So we're going to go really, really quietly up to what I want to show you and hopefully you can hear me whispering and the reason why I'm whispering will become very clear in a moment but before we go straight up that way I don't have one of those ash bags with me for wind direction but the wind is blowing so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a plan I'm just going to wait and see for when the wind starts to blow and I'm just going to get a little bit of dirt I'm down perfect for what I want to do. It's coming straight towards us. And I want to go show you something. It's something that we saw this morning, but everything takes on a whole different style when you're on foot. So we're going to approach it nice and nice and quietly to make our way around here. Let's see if we can get a nice view of what I want to show you. Since we're not just content with lepers, there's another spotted animal that's hiding in here that I want to show you. See if I can get a visual. So we can see them. They haven't realized that we're here. And it's the two hyena that we saw this morning. So if we just have a look through this gap, we should be able to see them perfectly. Hyenas are hiding down there. Now this is the injured hyena that we saw in the fight the other day. And if we just go sneak around her, oh, she's going to duck down again. She lifted her head up. She hasn't realized exactly where we are. But she has lifted her head up. She's shown a little bit of sign of us being aware of our presence. Gonna stay down. There you go. You can see her. She's been spending the whole day here, hiding by this pan. And it's so nice to see her. It's the first time I've seen her since she was involved in that fight a couple of weeks ago, looking much healthier, no longer limping. And she, with her is the sub-adult cub that we think is hers. She does have one of the cubs with her, and they've spent the whole day on this hot, humid day, maybe about 200 meters away from those mating leopards. As I said, 
approaching on foot is very, very different because we don't want to startle or disturb the animal. That's the whole idea, and that is actually where most of the skill in walking comes from, particularly if you're approaching. Now, the hyenas out in, on Juma are quite relaxed with people on foot, and in fact, I've had them follow me before while I've been out tracking. But because of the nature of this particular hyena, because I know her backstory, I don't want to disturb her at all. So what we're going to try and do now that she's relaxed a little bit, I'm just going to try and move slightly further, put the bush between us and her so that we don't disturb her with our view. And I'm going to try and show you the sub-adults. She's put her head back down. Now the one thing when you're approaching predators on foot is that they most important is that you don't let them smell you so that's kind of what we're trying to avoid so even if they are aware of your presence their reliance on their sense of smell is so intense that they don't want to that as soon as you are this is what's happening the wind is gusting around so that's changing direction round and around and I think it might make our approach from this angle a little bit more tricky I don't think we're going to manage it without disturbing them. And of course, I don't want to do that. We don't want to have any kind of a negative impact on them. So we're going to have to just leave that as our little cameo link. I don't want to disturb her anymore, especially because we know she has been through that fight. And I don't want to have to cause her to get up and waste energy running away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you back across to Brent so that I can move away from here quietly. And we'll catch up with you very soon. So, welcome back. They haven't moved from where they were when you jumped off onto foot with Jamie to go have a look at those hyenas taking advantage of that wonderful mud wallow. But I think we should be getting quite close to the next mating. I forgot to take time the last time they mated, but we can see what average time it's going, but they did mate quite quickly those first two times. So a very big warm safari live welcome to Michelle's geography class in Ohio. Although we are normally more a bio biology classroom out here, uh, Michelle, we will definitely take a geography question for you. Uh, Michelle would like to know whereabouts in South Africa we are. So we are in the eastern part or the northeastern part of South Africa in a province called Mpumalanga. And Mpumalanga basically translated means Mpuma to come out. Langa is sun. So where the sun rises. So we're out to base the east. Mozambique border is probably about 100 kilometers from us here. And we're about uh, three quarters of the way up uh, from the coast on the eastern side and in, in Cozy Bay. Uh, but specifically, we're in the low fault of South Africa. On average, uh, around 400 to 500 meters above sea level. Uh, hot, humid, uh, semi-arid, we get about 800, oh, sorry, I lie, sorry, about 635 millimeters of rain a year on average. This year we're probably going to get about half of what we normally get, so it is going to be a very dry year uh, due to El Nino, but uh, we are, with the area we're in at the moment is mostly on granite soils uh, with Gabbro to the east. Uh, Gabbro is a type of basalt soil, uh, very good for grasses, not so much trees. On the granite soils, you'll see we've got quite nice thick trees all around us. And then also we have a dolerite in, in sort of incursions, dolerite ridges and rhyolite ridges that cut through the granite substrate. So I hope that is a little bit of a geography lesson for you guys there in Ohio. Uh, if you have any more geography questions, feel free to ask. I'll try my best uh, to answer them. But hopefully, let's switch back to the biology section of the, 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 the lesson this afternoon uh, and back to these leopards who hopefully are going to be mating again very soon. It smells some rain in the air. So Craig is here and I said I would ask him about Tandy's last cubs and she does spend more time down in Craig's neck of the woods. Um, one male, 
ages. So it was a male cup or three, four Okay, there we go. There's Craig. Hello. Um, oh, Tingana moved. That might sometimes incites a little bit of passion in the ladies, but not this time. So Craig says it was a male cub, not a female cub, and it hasn't been seen in three or four months. So it's obviously dispersed. You can see Mr. Tingan has found himself a really nice pillow. Texas is wondering whereabouts exactly is Tandy's home range. So it's to the southeast of us, Anne, um, around Chita Plains, Chitwa Chitwa, and into Mala Mala. before the storm. For those of you who might have joined us a little bit late at the Sunset Safari, uh, we are with a mating pair of leopards. And it is one of Karula's progeny. Uh, her name is Tandi, which is short for Tandikile, the loved one. And she's moved out of her natal range to mate with Tingana, who is lying up next to her. And she is the litter mate and sister of Shadow. So quite nice to meet the other first member of Karilla's first litter. And can you believe it or not, we actually even saw Mvula as well earlier on on the drive. Um, he is probably about two and a half kilometers to the north of us at the moment. says that Tandi has a neck on her left ear and Shadow has a neck on her right ear as a distinguishing feature. Uh, also, just for me, looking at her, she's much, much darker. Her face is much darker than Shadow's. And her 3-3 three, three spot pattern. I can't remember offhand what uh, Shadow's is, but I don't think it's 3-3. Three, three. shadow somewhere so there we go shadow is a three four for those who are interested so tandy's a three three and have a look here i've got a picture so on the right shadow has a three and, and then a four, including a very small one there. So shadow is a three, four. And you can see a little bit of resemblance in the face, but, and you see how much lighter shadow's face is than Tandy's. If we have a look at Tandy now, you can see much darker in the face. And Tom's wondering, do we carry a notebook around with us all the information on these leopards or is it just in our heads? Well, we remember most of it and if we forget, we've got our wonderful viewers who are, have been keeping track of these leopards since the beginning of the live drives and they, if we ever step out of line, they're there to put us right back in. So, 
can you believe it? When I was tracking this morning, uh, helping Jamie, I was following these tracks just before the end of drive. I probably turned around 150, 200 meters from here. Should have kept walking. So we're right on the top side of the Mawati, a little river system that flows through the center of Juma. You can just see the sand through there where Andrew's showing you. So we're right on the top of the eastern bank. So we have been chatting a little bit about Shadow and Tuddy. And I will c touch on their success with Cubs and whatnot shortly. But AJ is wondering why do leopards have spiked penises? Is this sort of some evil trick of evolution? Well, it, it is and it isn't. It's a very important evolutionary trick. So even domestic cats and lions also have barbed penises. Uh, and what that does is while they're copulating, um, when the male ejaculates, it is to try and possibly keep as much of the sperm inside uh, the female as possible to have the greatest chance uh, or the greatest chance of actually impregnating her. And that's also why they've mated so frequently over uh, such a short time. Because remember, she's only been estrus for a very short time. So they've got four or five days um, where they can mate constantly. So all the little evolutionary tricks to sort of ensure impregnation. So I know we had a question a little bit earlier about this, uh, Tundi's success with cubs. And as I said, I don't know much about Tundi. And fortunately, I've got Craig who's shaking his head at me as well. He doesn't know a lot either. So maybe some of our long-time viewers um, who keep an eye on what, what's happening with the leopards around the, this part of the world can let me know how many litters Tundi has had, how many of those have been successful. Uh, Shadow, we know she's had... Or if we want to be honest about it, theoretically zero successful litters. Uh, and I know a lot of you have been asking about Sindile uh, and what's happening. Um, all, I, all I can tell you now, he is still um, in that facility where he is put. Unfortunately, he, he's probably not going to be coming back. Uh, and he is still under quarantine for rabies. very sad for a lot of us. He was dear to a lot of us here. And we spent many, many hours with that young man. But removing a leopard that has uh, possibly been tainted by an infected animal, uh, as, much, as hard as it is for a lot of people uh, who've been watching the show and watch them grow up, uh, it is necessary. We cannot have a, a potential threat like that uh, wandering around. Uh, rabies can spread at an incredible speed through a population. Uh, of, of cats, uh, dogs, and a rabid animal becomes extremely aggressive and will feel nothing attacking an elephant, uh, a lion, even even a small leopard. So it is it was the right decision to remove him from the reserve. to do a bit of grooming. Hopefully that is going to be a prelude to a bit of flirting. Myself, but the prospect of seeing leopard cubs one day seems exciting. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Safari Dean, but unfortunately, uh, probably not going to see too many of Tandy's cubs. As I said, female leopards move well out of their natal home range to mate, and uh, 
Oh, you never know what could happen there. But still another three months. They got just between a 90 and 102 day gestation period. But one must remember uh, leopards in the Sabi sand specifically, the cubs uh, have about a 70% mort mortality rate before they're a year old. Uh, lots of things are dangerous if you're a little leopard. And obviously, the mother often leaves them alone about for three or four days at a time while she has to hunt. There we go, guys. Here comes the flirting. Look at that. She's going to try inspire him to move. Isn't that incredible? Watch how she moves around. She'll try to put her tail almost in his face. And you can hear that deep growling. Oh, she doesn't put herself in the best position there, but there we go. Unfortunately for us, just on the other side of the log. It is one of the most incredible sounds in the African bush. Doesn't quite sound like anything else uh, you will ever hear out here. So, very, very short little bursts. That's why they have to mate so often. It doesn't last very long at all. See how she's rolled onto her back now, trying to make sure the semen stays inside. So night shift runner is, is, is still a little bit confused about the barbed penis story. So he says, does it get stuck when he's mating? It is. So while he is ejaculating, it's, it's trying to stay inside. So once he's finished ejaculating, he needs to disembark. It actually hurts her. And that's why she turns around and gives him a good swat. Okay. Now they're going to make our lives very difficult. And we're going to try to follow them. But they are going down an area that is incredibly hard to get into now. We're on earth. I've got to do the clap quickly for that. Okay. Andrew, why did you steal the, the remote for the, the car? Because I was sitting on it. It's possible. You weren't so messy, friend. If I wasn't so messy, Andrew. No, I know you've been here moving my stuff, Andrew, while I was talking. See if we can find a spot. Now, completely bizarrely, just as you disappeared away from Brent, Brent's going through a bit of a rough signal patch, but he will be back up and running very shortly. But I think I just heard a lion roar. There's a lion calling from, I think it's across a torchwood. We're actually at Dinyala Road North, which is the, probably the one and only time that at present you're ever going to get to see this particularly beautiful area. I'm specifically... Cold. Try and listen. See. Apparently we disappeared, but we are back up and running. Bim has to stay now completely still. <laughs> it's not our plans. And see what we can find. VM can manage to navigate his way around the drainage line. So we've mentioned before that drainage line is a particular place to come and wander through because they have some of the most beautiful trees in the world, in my opinion. And Yonder Road North is actually my favorite road in Jura, to be completely honest. We just don't always get to put it on the camera. Let's go have a look at this incredible drainage line system that's along here, see if we can find a nice clear path through, and I'll show you what I mean. You can see 
where the water has through. Obviously not this year, since we would have had to have had water to do that. Just look at how spectacular this particular clearing is and this drainage line system that has cut so deeply through this area. So drainage lines are where seep lines essentially collect and the water erodes a path through them. You can even see that jackalberry that's it's almost been washed away completely. Its roots are sticking out almost on its way out. Here you go, you can have a look and see that's where the water has traveled and obviously hit a corner and completely eroded it away. Favorite trees, jackalberries, and we'll probably stop and have a bit of a chat about them at some point during this walk since there are so many of them. It's interesting that we often stop at dung. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back in the vehicle with us. Hello everyone. Being out in the bush and being out there live has its technical challenges. We're experiencing some of that now and are working on it as fast as possible to get it sorted and get you back. We are so sorry about that. It seems as though Brent is black screen as well. It's the price we pay for leopard sightings in drainage lines. But we do, or we have happened to encounter, one of the biggest warthogs I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Which is why we're not back on foot, we raced back to the vehicle to drive us out of a bad signal patch. And came upon this particular site. This warthog has the most enormous tusks. Come on boy, I need you to come out to show everybody how exciting you look. Two female and Yala nibbling away next to him. 
And poor VM is perched and balanced now on the back. He's still got his backpack on. We did such a mad race in order to try and get onto a good signal area so that we weren't on a technical loop for too long. And unfortunately, the gremlins are playing a bit of a role this afternoon in both Rusty and the bushwalk. Well, I think since we are here and we have the opportunity, I might just pull off the road and we can take a bit of a stroll about from here. Try one last time to get you a good view of that warthog. Oh, it's lying in smud wallowing. Oh, it's just got up as we stopped. A little bit skittish, as you know our warthogs generally are. They tend to get a bit uncomfortable. Okay, well, how do you feel about walking here, Vim? You might have to watch a slightly ungainly dismount from the vehicle. I'm going to jump out so I can help Vim in this particular case. So that he can manage with an extra pair of hands. And oh wow, well done Vim. I didn't even need to help him down. <laughs> and now that we are down, apparently Brent has picture again and he still has the leopards. Welcome back everyone. So they've come down Unfortunately, they're right in the base of a drainage line. So, not the best signal, so we can't really move. So there's Tingana in front of us. Tandy off to the left. So it's probably been a long time uh, since Tandy was this deep in the area she was born. So I'm not sure whether she was actually born on Juma, but I'm guessing so, since Karua normally likes to give birth around the Vuatella Lodge. So Robin would like to know if I think Tingana is sterile since he's done a lot of mating and we haven't got any cubs yet. Uh, probably not. Uh, I don't think he's sterile. He's probably the father of Sindile, just from the territory that Shadow spent most of her time in. But I don't think he's sterile. You must remember that the females also are, are part of that and they don't get pregnant every time they mate. So they could be go through three Easter cycles before they actually get pregnant. And that's why the male leopards have the barbed penises, the females immediately go lie on their back after mating. It's all these things to try and ensure impregnation. She's coming back. about to start again. <laughs> and he just pops his head down. <laughs> so I said most of the mating is initiated by the females. They almost harass him and it gets worse towards the end of a long mating session. So they are mating much faster than 15 minutes between copulations. So while we were trying to get into position, they mated again. So I'd say this is definitely early on day one or day two. Look at 
that. So <laughs> they're going to lie down in the base of the Muati. I'm not sure. Are we not going to? That's all we're going to see. But uh, I'm going to. If I move, we might lose signal. Mm, decisions, decisions. So we're going to try it out. Hopefully, we don't lose signal. Now, unfortunately, it seems as though Brent is struggling with a bit of a problem with his signal. But as soon as he comes back up and he's still with those leopards, we will go straight back across to him. Fascinatingly enough, as we're making our way towards Biffles Hook Dam, it's raining. <laughs> it's been threatening to all day. There was a bit of a light drizzle and now it is actually raining on us. And it's incredibly nice. It's very enjoyable to be out here walking in the bush in the rain. But it does mean that I have to cover the backpack. So Vim, when you think it's a bit hard, just give me a shout and I will cover it up for you. What do you think? We might need to do that. So one of those funny disjointed afternoons that's gone not quite according to plan. So I think we'll have to, before we go up to Bufflesick Dam, I might have to do a bit of a rain cover cover. Just to show you something. Can I take the camera for a second? Thank you. This is a walking backpack that is full of electronics and that blue cover there is the one that I'm going to be popping on. So I'm going to hand this back to Viam so he can show you the beautiful scenery, my camera skills and I'm going to try and figure this out without unlatching the entire, the entire design which I don't fully understand. There's some bungee cords around. There we go. This is where the this is the absolutely emergency rain cover. If we need to pop it over the camera, so we can just shove it in there if we need to. And then we've got our cover here, which is one of those amazingly versatile little things that pops out of a very tiny bag. Oh, well, let me see if I can figure out how to fit this on Vim so that he doesn't get any electronics wet. Tuck it around. Tuck that down there, tuck that in there. Huh, that should be okay. What do you think, Bill? We got it. I can't really see. You can't, yeah, no. <laughs> well, all the, all the important dangly bits are covered. That's how you, that's how you protect things from rain, isn't it? Yes. I'll, um, I'll keep hold of the really subtle emergency camera bag for, for emergencies, if it does start to get heavier. And of course now as we've done that the rain has started to stop again. But let's go see what Mysteries Biffles Hook Dam holds for us. Now I figured that since we can't do Nyala Road North, it's not unheard of for Karula when there's another leopard in her territory to actually try and make her way towards where that leopard is and watch what they, what's happening with a sort of disgusted look on her face apparently. This is what I've been told. And female leopards do, they don't appreciate um, interlopers in their territory, but with a male involved, she's not going to be up to challenging Tingana. Males are particularly protective over the females that they're mating with, and thus she's not going to in any way challenge the presence of her daughter. Let's see what's around here. Oh, the wonderful thing about being out in the bush on foot is that you get to experience every aspect of it without a noisy engine sometimes coming between you and it. Which means everything from the vast silences to the smell of the rain, which is particularly dominant at this point, also means that we can wander across the Buffles Hook Dam wall without any fear of collapsing down into the middle of it. You hear something? No. I'm starting to be entirely reliant on 
Viam's hearing. <laughs> you know, since he's first heard the leopard, there's one absolutely terrified Franklin over there. Now, I did wonder a little bit about whether or not either Karula or Mvula might decide to make themselves known around here. I'm glad that Mvula showed himself. This is not a view that we get to sit and watch very often. But Mvula is starting to get to the point where Tingana is really, really intruding upon his territory. And it's getting to the point where we're starting to expect that Mvula might begin to go nomadic in that particular respect. Now, Keith, I know that you were wondering, Keith, you were wondering, oh, this could be risky. I could go tumbling down the Wipples of Dam Wall. So Keith was wondering what the average lifespan of a leopard is and whether or not the males or the females live longer. And Keith, the answer to that question is that males definitely have a shorter lifespan. It's a hard world out there for a male leopard, although they do love drainage lines like the one VM just showed you. Beautiful view down there. So the, the males will have a shorter lifespan and you're usually looking at around 12 or 13 years old at which point they start to become what's known as nomadic males. They get pushed out of their normal territory and they have to head off and basically just avoid any other big dominant males. Oh and I do want to show you this particularly beautiful seed since we are here. Let me try and see if I can grab one for you. And this is a particularly fine specimen of a russet bush willow. You can see why it's called russet. If you look at the colors of the seeds. So for those of you interested in Latin names of trees, Combretum heroriense. And what Combretum tells us is that it is a relative of that protected leadwood that we tell you so much about. Now these beautiful four-lobed seeds that unify this whole family are a great way of course of dispersing the seeds, catching the wind. That one I don't think was ready. <laughs> it's not going to go blowing off. <laughs> but it's also a good way of making, if you tear off the edges of the leaf, and it works better with red bush willow, but you can do it with russet as well. Avoid the seeds inside the kernel, which I don't think we're going to be able to break open. Oh, there they are, in there. So you don't want to eat the seeds. But if you boil up a selection of these outside covering of the seeds, you can actually make a tea from it. And it's quite a popular tea. So either the red bush willow or the russet bush willow. If you're outside and you're desperate, then that is the way forward. And there's one other, there's one other tree, and I'm actually going to ask this to you as a quiz, see if you guys have been listening, because I know I've definitely told you, and I'm sure Brent has as well. And Pim looks as though he's about to fly away with that cover on. I'll keep an eye on it. There's one other tree that you can use for a sort of a recreational, either tea or coffee purpose. And one last thing to show you, the leaves of this tree easily identifiable. It's one of the smallest leaves of any of the Combretum species. And why am I showing you this? Because the Combretum family is the dominant tree in this bush felt. So these tiny little leaves to give you a perspective. Between the russet and the red, the variable and the large fruited bush willows, those are the most dominant tree species that we get out here. And in fact, when people refer to this kind of ecosystem or this kind of habitat, they actually refer to it as a bush willow woodland. And you can see why with a combination of those incredible seeds, why this tree takes on the name russet bush willow. Oh, man. <laughs> Katie's going to fall down the damn wall. And Kevin Dyer, this is why I appreciate bushwalks as well. This different perspective of the dam, and maybe we should go and wander down into it now that it's completely dry. We'll make our way around it and we'll go and really have a look at what's happening inside it, all the patches of water, the stagnant water. And it's actually a perfect opportunity. Remember that elephant for regular viewers? That elephant that we saw wandering through the mud here? I think this is a perfect opportunity to 
make our way down and go and show you exactly how deep that one particular hole goes. I wasn't able to do it at the time because it was still fresh, fresh mud and I would have slid straight into it and quite possibly not being able to climb out of it. And at that point, my dignity was a little bit, it, it, it had taken a few knocks. <coughs> now important when you make an approach like this, always to be aware of the fact that animals really like water and they move between the dams, particularly at this time of day. So you'll notice that I'm always walking with my head up, just keeping a close eye on what decides to come down here. And if they're not after the water, they will be after the mud. And Kristen, no, this is not where the Juma Dam camera is, although it is one of the only water sources on Juma. And how often do you get to see buffalo tracks, by the way, in perspective of size? This is a buffalo track here. This is the one half and the other half. And you can actually see their feet are bigger than my hand, pretty much at my hand. Look, I'm not the biggest person in the world. And in this particular case, there's a slight, slight flick of dirt at the toe. And that's the direction. that likes to do that is a hippo and in fact we've got a nice hippo track right next to Vim to show you as well <coughs> and another perspective got the four toes of the hippo wandering down towards the mud now this probably happened sometime in the last few days it's pressed into the mud and I suspect it might be that individual that we've seen recently in the pan, but I don't know that for sure, which is again, one of those reasons why we're extra cautious at this time of year around these dams. But just to finish up answering Kristen, no, it's not where the Juma Dam is. We're about two kilometers away from that particular dam. But it does give us a really fascinating perspective on the different places that we get to see from the back of the vehicle. But as Kevin said, looks so, so different when you're out on foot. And you can see what I mean about there being water. There's stagnant water all around these pools, filled with algae. You can see how unpleasant that water actually looks. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be drinking that unless I was absolutely desperate. Definitely not pleasant, but for animals that are desperate, it is the way forward. And just an update on Brent as to where he is. He's still with the leopards, but he's struggling with signal. So what he's gonna try and do is get higher, up onto higher ground so that he'll be able to share those visuals with you. I, can't, I think I'm hearing voices. I think there's people driving around. I keep hearing a sound. Uh, VM's incredible in terms of wandering around with that backpack and actually keeping the camera steady. And now, of course, I've brought him on a mission impossible because he's got to try and keep his footing, plus film, plus keep an eye on it. And James, you were wondering how heavy that equipment is. Uh, how heavy is it because VM does such an incredible job both filming and navigating at the same time. How heavy is it VM? It's about 15. I'm going to weigh it but I know the batteries weigh 5 to 15. So the batteries, just the batteries alone, and how many do we have? Two. Two batteries. So the batteries alone, 5 kilograms, so about 10 pounds. I'm not going to make you come this way VM, I'm just going to show them this hole. <laughs> VM's managing very well. Whoopsie. So this is the elephant hole where he was standing and stretching all the way out to the plants. And as VM navigates, he weighs, his backpack weight is about, I would say 15 kilograms easily. That's about 30, over 32 pounds. So there you go. 
I couldn't really show you this property the other morning because I was in the vehicle, but I did try and give you a perspective and this enormous hole was his sort of, one of his final stopping points. <laughs> Don't disappear into the hole, VM. Just to give you an idea of how deeply he was in this mud. And that's when we heard the sucking noise as he pulled in and you could actually see where his feet slid down along the side there and then into the mud. And he was, of course, after all of these green plants, this has provided a perfect growing habitat for them. They are an invasive species and they don't actually belong here, but apparently the elephant didn't find it too objectionable. And you can even see how, you can just imagine how deep this would have been when I first started working here in July. So I would have been underwater. Viam, even with his giant antenna, would have been underwater in July. At this time of year, this dam should be overflowing all the way to the back of that drainage line there. So it really is quite sad to see in its own way. But of course, we have discussed a lot about the possible positives of this drought. And Night Shift Runner, who is a new viewer and a warm welcome. No, I'm just sorry, you might have seen how I stumbled my way across there. Sheer respect for Viam, who's doing an amazing job of keeping up over all the different mud waddles. So Night Shift Walk, you were wondering, is this man-made? And yes, it is. Most of the dams in this area are constructed by people, which means in turn that they are responsible for the upkeep of these dams. And that's actually what this structure is here. So a gabion or a gabion is a way of reducing erosion that happens around man-made dams and other dams, but especially man-made dams, because of course you've got increased animal traffic. They're feeding around this area, they're moving to and from between the water source. And for them, what that means is that they remove all of the grass cover and a lot of the vegetation cover as well. And you wind up with erosion channels like this one that we have here starting to form. So the combination of the gabions or the gabions as well as brush packing is to try and prevent the runoff and the dongas, what we call dongas, it's a very colloquial South African term. So what we know as of dongas, creating these artificial channels where there shouldn't be channels in a natural environment. So it's one of those interesting cases, and we talked about it with the hippo before, about the fact that man-made and pumped dams have actually, in their own way, contributed to the harshness of the effect of this drought. Because animals get used to there being dams here. It brings species like impala and buffalo that wouldn't necessarily always be around here, or wouldn't spend as much time around here. And that in turn moves other species, like the sable that was seen for the first time on the Juma Dam camera, that actually moves them out of these areas. So it's an interesting, they, they're essentially just out-competed, entirely well-meaning, but just one of those things to consider. And of course for us, having dams like these are incredibly positive, and it's good to see that people have been maintaining them and keeping an eye on things. Try and find them an easy way around. And Gilly, who's watching in Wisconsin, he wanted to know if there's relatives of the willow tree out here. And I'm gonna look for one that would be quite a useful comparison. So willow trees, the bark of willow trees have pain-killing properties, as Gilly has said. And it's actually the derivative of where aspirin first came from. It was derived from the bark of a willow tree. And we do have our own equivalents, not necessarily willow relatives, but equivalent trees that will have pain reducing effects. And I'm just going to see if I can find you one, Gilly. But a really good example of it is a sickle bush. The bark of a sickle bush has pain relieving properties. And there's all kinds of things that you can use trees for. For example, I'm sure many of the other guides have commented on this, or presenters. The weeping wattle or the toilet paper tree as it is colloquial no, colloquially known. And essentially, 
we have all this all the pharmacy effects that we might need on hand as we wander through. We've got Imodium in certain respects. Well, some barks are used as a cure for hangovers or anything similar. So in a way, very similar to the aspirin effect of the tree. I'm just going to rescue Vim here since it is, has stopped raining. And he's currently now got a cape, which is accompanying him and sort of flapping along in the air. So I will leave him of that and take a moment to fold it up just now. Now Gilly, I'm really looking for a sickle bush to be able to show you. So it's a way for us to, this isn't the perfect environment for sickle bush, but the bark works very similar to the way aspirin bark does. So you can use it as a painkiller or a headache reliever and actually brewed in a very similar way. So stewing it, to create an infusion similar to tea is basically the way that you can use sickle bush. Spike thorn works as emodium. So just wandering through, we've already come past a couple of trees that have medicinal effects. These spike thorn leaves, if you ever find yourself with stomach complaints, you've seen me eat them before and I'm not going to repeat the process because it's now I don't have any water on me to help relieve the dryness of the mouth. And where is there a sickle bush? There's got to be a sickle bush. The place is filled with sickle bushes until you want to find one. What other medicinal effects do we have? Of course, all of the little tiny perennial plants also all have their individual effects that are useful to have. And even the marula trees. So the bark of the marula tree, that cambium layer, and we can actually go and have a look at what I mean by cambium layer. But the cambium layer essentially <laughs> is a family of heart attack birds running away from us. They're gonna duck away. What do I mean by heart attack birds? I mean crested Franklin that very often wait until you are right on top of them and then relying on their camouflage to hide them and then explode out of the grass at your feet. And that's why I always think of them as heart attack birds. So one last thing that I wanted to show you was the cambium layer of the trees. And obviously I'm referring to, in this case, the rich stringy layer. This is a knob thorn tree, but all trees have it. This rich stringy layer that the elephants really love to strip and attack. In marula trees, to continue on with our medical theme, it is an antihistamine. So if you ever find yourself with an allergic reaction to a wasp sting or a bee sting, it's not powerful, so if you're really allergic, you need something like an EpiPen. But if you find yourself with a slight sort of contact allergy, you just rub the bark ever so gently on your skin and it will help to relieve it. The good news is that Brent is back up and running, so let's pop over to him for an update. Welcome back everyone, we tried our best. We positioned the vehicle in about 25 different spots in the base of that drainage to try get a picture. Uh, unfortunately we couldn't. This is one of the frustrations about being live in the African bush. But we did get some incredible footage and I know it was a lot of your first time seeing mating leopards because we've had lots of new viewers. So really exciting. I've asked the guys to let me know if they move out of that low lying area. Be back there in a split second. So I'm sure you guys have got a lot of questions about uh, leopards and mating leopards, uh, and now that they're not mating in front of us, feel free to fire away. Uh, send them through at machine gun speed if you need, and you can do that if you are new by popping it on an email to me at questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So at the moment those leopards are in a really bad area for us uh, due to how low they are and we can't send a signal through to our repeater. And we're wondering, do they keep mating in the same area or does the honeymoon moon move around? Susie Jenny, the female will be following the male as he continues on his normal scent marking. 
So they will move around and they can actually move quite big distances while they're mating. And uh, it is so unfortunate that we weren't able to stay there. We're going to try to maybe get Jamie and get Jamie to try pop that backpack onto the 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 tracking vehicle, and we can put it higher up on the vehicle so make sure that the, the the signal is or the the antenna is higher, and see if we can try get Jamie in there. I'm going to just jump on the blower quickly and see what the vehicle lineup is there. Jan, Jan. Hey, my friend. Jan, confirm still just you and Ephraim in that sighting. Yeah, I've been uh, here at the moment. I know Ephraim is making his way here. Okay, copy, thanks. Uh, we're going to try to send one of our other vehicles in there. So um, their game drive comps don't seem to be operational, but there will be a third vehicle coming to join you. Yeah, copy that. Uh, and you think you have been in position for you guys, or what did you guys say? Copy, thanks very much, Jan. We really appreciate it. Okay, so we're going to try to see if Jamie and Viem with that backpack with a long pole mounted high on a vehicle might be able to get in there with the, the mating pair. So they're going to start making their way there. Uh, till then, I'm unfortunately you're stuck with me instead of mating leopards. But as I said, I'll try to answer all your questions on mating leopards uh, while Jamie's on her way there. Look at that. Look at that perfect little hole in this cloud and the sun bursting through. I looked too closely at it. I'm now temporarily blind. Look at that. It's sort of a perfect hole through the cloud. So, quite often I tell you guys, pop your pictures on the Safari Live page. Uh, pop your pictures on Twitter. Use the hashtag Safari Live. I think I've got a new challenge for all our viewers, and I'm hoping you guys uh, jump on this challenge. So instead of posting a picture to the Safari Live page uh, or to the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, I'm saying, let's see if you can post a little video. So I want everyone out there to do their best mating leopard impersonation and pop it on Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to do mine for you guys now. So you just heard it. So, so there's my mating leopard impression. So there we go. Andrew, your turn. So there we go. We've done ours. We'll get Jamie and Vim to do theirs as well. So why don't you guys uh, take a little video, put your best mating leopard impressions on our Facebook page, uh, which is Safari Live, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or use the at Wild Earth on Twitter. Pop your best mating leopard impersonation on Facebook. Please, guys, do keep it clean, though. We just want the audio. Jamie rushes towards there. I'm actually going to slowly meander back up to the northwest, um, and maybe Mvula could have come back towards uh, Juma. Thanks to Ellen Fowler, who's been a firm, staunch supporter of us for a long time. She's just giving me a bit more information on Tandy. So two other cubs. Uh, she had Bahuti, who is a, a young male. He became a dispersal male, a little bit older than Quarantine and Kunyuma. And Scott has actually seen him uh, on drive. And then another cub, Wabba Misa, I think it was called. And that uh, cub was killed by the Styx male lions. So thanks very much for that info, Ellen. 
it's always great because I mean, even though it seems like uh, for the new viewers, all you've ever seen was uh, is, is Scott, James, Jamie, and myself, uh, and Peter and Hayden, of course. But there were guys before us, and the show the show has been running since I think, 2007 or 2008. And obviously, every year we aim to get better and better, improve the technical difficulties. So 2016, from what I hear, is going to be a, a cracker. And looking forward to it and it's going to be really exciting and really great to have all of you along on the back of the vehicle with us for this amazing adventure that we're on mating and lion mating can be really really aggressive and uh, Annie in British Columbia is saying it doesn't seem to be enjoyable uh, for either a male or female it, are they completely ruled by sort of hormones and the, and the need to mate they, they, they are the need to procreate and, and produce the next generation is what drives that and especially for that first day or two it can be very very uncomfortable and you'll notice noticed but unfortunately we couldn't get the picture through that uh, both Tandy and uh, and, um, and uh, Tingana have, have a few little bloody spots from them swatting each other so uh, it is purely that need to to create to breed uh, that is driving them in this situation there is almost I, I can't see any pleasure in that is still watching and uh, Alicia who's 15 years old uh, would like to know do leopards stay together are they a monogamous couple uh, they are not so what will happen and I think the best way to illustrate this is to draw you a picture in the sand so I'm going to do that where's going to be a good piece of sand that looks like a decent piece of sand what do you reckon Andrew Perfect there we go so what I'm going to do is I'm going to also, because my earpiece is going to be out, uh, tell Andrew to wave at me if Jamie has a picture around the leopard so you don't miss the leopards while I'm fiddling around in my sandpit. So, how's this here, Andrew? That's good. So let's make a nice, clear little uh, stick. You always need a stick when you're drawing in the sand. It's better than using your fingers. So if we clear the sand like this, um, we're just going to draw a very basic sort of square. Um, it's much easier. Let's say... That is a game reserve. How's that look? Can you see that nicely, Andrew? Yes. Okay. So let's just, for example, use a very basic square. That is a game reserve. Um, and leopards are not at all hemmed in by fences. So let's say that is one male territory like that. And this is probably another male territory like that. And then you'll probably have a female territory in here another one in there another one over here maybe even a little one just coming in in the corner so basically you'll probably have two or three dominant males in a big area uh, and their territory will encompass sometimes up to three or four different females territories and even if there's just a tiny bit of a females territory that comes through uh, they will mate with that male so they'll mate with multiple males so by no means monogamous they will actually mate with any male around so every male thinks that they're the dad because if they don't they will kill her cubs so if they kill her cubs it immediately forces her to come back into estrus so she'll start mating again so if he thinks the cubs aren't his he'll kill them so he can try and mate with her and make sure her next set of cubs are his
another question from Michelle's class. Carla, uh, who's 16, uh, would like to know what would happen if the lions found the leopard? Well, Carla, they would probably try to kill them. They always do try to kill uh, competing predators in an area, but the leopards are generally quite quick. They would jump up a tree and get out of the lion's way. We actually have seen that before. Uh, with a mating pair of leopard, uh, the first male leopard we saw in Vula and another female called Quatile uh, were chased by two Styx lionesses, not too far from where Tingana and Tandi are now. But since you guys are a geography class and we seem to be doing a lot of biology questions, uh, if we pan off into the distance, uh, there we go, there's the Drakensberg Mountains right in the distance there and that's one of the longest mountain ranges in Africa. And Andrew is being not focused, and I said the mountains, not the corpies. So those corpies, oh, you can stay on them now that you're there, Andrew. You start something, you must finish it. So from a geography point of view, quite interesting. Those corpies are not part of the mountain range below, behind them. Um, those are little granite inselbergs. Uh, and those are actually within the Sabi Sands Game Reserve in the, in the south. So you do have these little granite inselbergs that come out. Unfortunately, we don't have any in the north. Uh, but where I've worked in the past, we do have those little granite, they're called, we call them copies, which is the Afrikaans word for basically a little a head. So it looks like little heads sticking out of the ground. And then behind is the foothills of the Drakensberg. Uh, it's the highest mountain range in South Africa. And you get to about 3,000 meters in, in, the, in the Maluti region of Lesotho, uh, on the border of South Africa and Lesotho. And you can see there's quite a lot of cloud covering them at the moment. So this is a question just for the geography class, Andrew, if we come out. And let's focus on this nice fluffy cloud over here. Uh, zoom in, one with a little light on there so we can see the marshmallow puff. Since you guys are geography class, why don't you guys tell me what cloud is that? Uh, what type of cloud is that? And send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So on our way towards that area where we found in Vula, we are going to go see if the lions might possibly have popped out. So you might radio just break. Ah, oh, someone has already sent in a video. Well done. I just missed the name there. Safari so Dean, well done. Has uh, already sent in the, f the first impression of the mating leopard. Well done. I look forward uh, to watching them. And I think, Andrew, what do you think? I think we're going to have to get the rest of the crew. The rest of the crew. Uh, since you're doing it, we'll do it. So uh, I think we're going to have to get Kirsten and Nikki and Scott and, and everyone uh, to post their videos of their mating leopard impersonation. Sorry, guys, you've been on the radio oh, for a second. Thank you, honey. Yes, that's me. Um, oh, there we go. Nice little birdie. You got him, Andrew? It's not the best for you. Thanks very much. And a little... Uh, a little... Not so little, but a, a European roller. Sitting in a pelter forum or a weeping wattle. So the reason it is called a weeping wattle is that the bird flies off. I'm going to stop next to it here now. I'm going to get Andrew to grab me that branch very kindly. Got to make the cameraman useful. The branch or the leaves? Oh, you can just do the leaves. Thank you, Andrew. So we'll chat about that now, but the reason it's called a weeping wattle is there's a small species of a spittle bug. And uh, or a frog hopper is another name for them. And they've got very developed back legs. And they, during the really dry, the dry part of the dry season, there's a couple of different species of tree they will sometimes uh, feed on. And they're able to suck sap at such a rate uh, and they expel it at almost, almost every second and second and a half. And what they expel, their urine, is almost pure water. Uh, and if you 
who's sitting under the tree when it happens. I have said that the tree is weeping. So a weeping wattle, another tree that they feed on is uh, called an apple leaf, or well, the other name for them is a rain tree, because it rains. But the other more common use for the weeping wattle while in the bush, the leaves are very, very soft. Um, it's also known as the toilet paper tree. Uh, gathered in large wads, very soft, velvety leaves. So if you ever stuck out in the African bush, a good one to remember. And I hear Jamie has already showed you it on bushwalk today. We'll just throw it to Andrew then. So it seems a real mystery where the Kahumas could have disappeared to. So, um, Andrew would like to know why my phone is pink. Susie. Susie, yes. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew found this very amusing win. So, on, on my way, uh, on Andrew and my way up to Zimbabwe, uh, I was always, I was getting a new phone. My other one had definitely seen better days. And just after the Christmas rush madness, uh, I wanted a very specific phone. I wanted the 128 gigabyte, whatnot. And we've done some research into the 4K camera that came with the phone. And so, very excited. And obviously, we don't go into big cities very often. So, I went to, how many high stores did we go to, Andrew? Three. Uh, and the only iPhone 128 gig available in the whole of Johannesburg, it seemed to be, was the pink one. And I wasn't going to wait another month uh, to get it, just for a different color. And as Jamie said yesterday, uh, at least I'm that comfortable with my masculinity that I don't mind having a pink phone. It does help when you have a wonderful girlfriend. Ah, so Final Control sent that through to Jamie, and she just said the same thing. I'm very lucky to have such a wonderful woman in my life. So I know Scott and Andrew traipsed this whole area looking for those lions to no avail this morning. I wonder where they could have gone. Tandi is her full name, but it is a it is a shortening of, of a longer Shangan word, which is Tandikile, which means the one that is loved. I hope that helps Brian. Now, Tangana, as far as I know, is a derivative of the shy one. As you can see, he wasn't that shy today. wondering, are leopards more aggressive when they're mating? Do we have to be a bit more careful? Uh, I wouldn't say more aggressive. They, they're probably, their hormones are a bit more so, not more aggressive, more aggressive towards each other most certainly. And sometimes if you position yourself in the wrong area, you could get misplaced aggression from them. But I wouldn't say they're more, 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 more dangerous than, than normal. And you should always show the animals the same amount of respect. Uh, that's the best way not to get into any trouble out here. A double cat, double cat afternoon. Well, we've done the double cat. I mean, the double cat species afternoon. And we find the lions. Hopefully, this is the area where the tracks disappeared into. Come out onto Impala Plain 
ones. Hopefully they're just lying out in the open for us. unlikely that the lions are lying out in the open. Morning in Pararas. And I hear we saw one of the first of the second birds, uh, one of the newborns. So quite often with Impala, you will have a late birth. So the females who didn't get pregnant in the sort of beginning of the rutting season, there'll often be a second rut a little bit later on, and those babies will start being born from now don't see any in this group though. These guys all look like they're a bit older. So Gracie, one of our favorite regular viewers, says, would that snake that Scott saw yesterday hurt a leopard? Gracie, if it did bite the leopard, yes, it, it, its venom is very, very strong and it would be able to hurt the leopard. But fortunately for the leopards and for the snake, they tend to avoid each other most of the time. coming through the clouds. So Eric, who's in Virginia Beach, uh, would like me to regale you guys with a story that happened quite a few years ago to the south of here, uh, where I was with a mating pair of leopards plus another few. So we had seven leopards in one sighting, uh, one male who was doing all mating, one young male who was stuck in a tree hissing, saying, I really don't want to be here, uh, and five females all trying to mate with the big male at the same time. So really, really incredible, and I, I probably will never see something like that again. Well, hopefully I do, but it is one of those strange things that happens that that many females estrus at the same time happen to descend on the whole campan male at the exact same time as well. Oh, attack of the area. So we are really looking forward to hearing your leopard mating impressions. Uh, keep sending them through. Don't worry, we will chase up the rest of the staff to do theirs. Uh, I think there should almost be a competition. Who's got the best mating leopard impression? So if you guys missed that earlier, or if you've just logged in, uh, I've challenged all our viewers to give us a <coughs> their version of uh, the sound that the mating leopards make and pop it onto our Facebook page or onto YouTube. And you, our Facebook page is Safari Live on YouTube, just, I mean, sorry, on Twitter, so not YouTube, on Twitter, just use the hashtag Safari Live, or use at Wild Earth, it's uh, uh, one of our Twitter accounts, and uh, just in case you've forgotten what it sounded like, and there's Andrew, well, there we go, see, let's see how good you guys are at imitating leopards. Speaking of amazing leopards, and hopefully you can hear them do it in real time, uh, with Jamie, who seems to have found a spot with some signal. Well, lucky for us, the bushwalk camera seems to have managed to maintain signal. So, well done to the bushwalk pack. VM is currently making do with my first aid kit as a bean bag to help steady the camera and this is my first time seeing Tundi up close and personal and what an awesome experience that is for us 
absolutely incredible. Now you'll notice I'm speaking very low and that's just because there is another vehicle that we are right next to, we're right on top of them and I don't want to detract from their experience either in any way. So I'm just going to be talking very softly. Now, VM and I have just discussing the fact that uh, Tingana seems to have a particular allure when it comes to the leopard ladies. But so far, no sign of pregnancy from any of the females that we've uh, seen him mating with. And Gilly, you were wondering if um, there's any kind of possibility that he might be sterile. Oh, sorry, Jilly. You were wondering if there's a possibility that he might be sterile or if there's any kind of ticks or insects that cause sterility in leopards or other animals. There is a possibility that he is sterile. That being said, I think we might also, there might be several different factors at play and not every met leopard mating session is entirely successful. So I'm not sure whether we can make that assessment, assessment just yet. What's she seen? She's seen something. head up looking at something in the bush could well be that hippo moving around and it's incredible how much like her sister she looks and just different my very first time seeing her hello girl where are you going are you going to go and no I thought she was going to go and have a look at Tingana And Georgian in Illinois, a warm welcome back, Georgian. We haven't had any questions from you for a long time, so I'm glad that you're back with us on these safaris. Now, apparently, you've let us know that Shadow and Tundi were born on February 2007. So thanks for that information. It's wonderful how well our viewers keep track of the movements of all of our leopards. I guess she just decided that that was a more comfortable spot to go and lie across. And we were discussing Tingana's sterility and the possibility that there are ticks or other parasites that might make any of the animals sterile. I wouldn't be surprised if there were also certain plant species that could contribute to sterility within animals. They very often affect the growth hormones in, for example, a growth of their of their claws or their hooves. There are certain poisonous types of plants that affect a type of protein that they produce. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's something similar that has an effect on sterility, but I don't know anything specifically that I can think of off the top of my head. And we've often remarked upon it with leopards. Isn't it incredible how they can find a spot and look completely comfortable? Doesn't matter how uncomfortable the spot really is. Just draping themselves across the side of a drainage line. Crystal, who's watching in California, you're saying a big warm welcome to Tundi, and it's your first time meeting this beautiful leopard. And Crystal, I was also incredibly excited when I first found them and sat and watched and thought it was Shadow. Shadow, but with something different about her. I can't describe to you the excitement of seeing a new leopard in an area that you've got so familiar with the different leopard characters that we get to see.
Naraisa, you were wondering whether Tundi, or if I'd heard anything about Tundi mating with the Anderson male, or if Tingana was her first choice. Raisa, I haven't heard about her mating with the Anderson male. I did, however, hear of a possibility of her mating with another leopard, and I want to just confirm it with some of the other guides before I pass on inaccurate information to you. So I'll double check that for you, Raisa. I'm sure somebody from Arethusa told me about Tundi mating with another male. And given that her territory is usually much further south of where we are now, there's always the possibility that it's one of the big males coming up from Mala Mala that might have been mating with her previously. But obviously at, a, at the moment, Tingana is the flavor of the month, or the last few months for our yeah. lady leopards. Hmm? Flavor of the year. Flavor of the year, VM says. There was a patch where we watched Tingana mate go from mating with Kutile to Shadow to Karula and back to Shadow all in the space of about three or so months. Now uh, there's another vehicle coming up behind us so just bear with me one moment while I hop on the Game Drive channel. I need to be able to make space for Ephraim. Although I'm just going to see if he's going to be able to get up onto the drainage line wall. But I don't think he's going to be able to. So what we might need to do is pull out of the sighting and then reposition from the opposite side of the drainage line. So essentially behind where the leopards are sitting now. And while we do that, Let's pop over to Brent to get an update from his side. So, welcome back. Apparently the cats are having a little snooze. And uh, here we go. A little bit easier, but the same type of cloud we asked about a little bit earlier. It's standing out by itself. There we go. So Rachel and twelve others think Allostratus and Frankie and four others think Nimbostratus. I'm going to disagree with you, I'm afraid. I think this is a, a baby cumulus, and it's, it's, it's still building. So if we have a look, this is the same cloud, we're just in a different part of the, the reserve now. Um, you see how it's starting to anvil up at the top there. So this is a cumulus, you see it's like big, fluffy, puffy um, mushrooms, or I mean not mushrooms, marshmallows is the word I'm looking for. So with these cumulus clouds, uh, they often build straight up and they almost form an anvil, like a blacksmith's anvil right at the top. This is a little one, uh, and you can see very heavy in the base, but they go really, really high up into the sky and form those big anvils. It is a bit difficult because there is quite a lot of um, stratus around as well, but I should say look for the fluffy marshmallowness of the cumulus cloud. So there you go. Well done, guys. It was quite difficult. You can see there's lots of different clouds around. Um, some very distinct stratus off over there on the on the horizon, Andrew. We drop down there. And so you see the stratus almost always flat, much more flat, and the cumulus, that puffy building. So we didn't have any luck with any lion, any lion tracks. And uh, I don't see any allostratus, but I remember quickly, allostratus is quite a lot higher. Um, I am looking, this is all a little bit lower. No. Um, so we didn't have any luck with those lines, so we are going to check for Mbula again. I'm just going to ask Ephraim uh, if he was still sleeping on the same termite mound when they left. Ephraim, Ephraim. Uh, when you left Mvula, was he still Lala on top of that Shadulu? Yeah. 
Copy, thanks. So, it looks like he might still be there. He was sleeping on top of that same termite mound when we left him. Uh, who knows, hopefully he might come back to the west a little bit. So, let's give you an idea now that we're up on some high ground here. Um, okay, so, where Mvula was is over there. About there. So, that's about where Mvula was. Just off that crest of that ridge there. And then you watch there as the horizon dips down. I'm going to just maybe reverse a little bit. So we see if we look through this gap here, you can see there's a crest in the distance there. Let me get Andrew to zoom in a bit. So you can see on that crest in the distance, but if we come down and there's a valley here, there's actually two valleys, one that runs almost north-south and the other uh, east-west. And I'd say Tangana and Tandi are there, probably about two and a half, three kilometers apart. So there we go. And hopefully um, he is still sitting in the spot uh, where he left him. As I said, he was looking quite tired. He is looking very old. Uh, but by no means is he out of for the count. So when male leopards get dispersed out of their territories, like Mvula pretty much has, I think he still does have some core territory left. Uh, what? What they do is they end up sneaking around in the peripheries, pretty much like we saw them doing today. So we've seen Tangana both cross into Buffalo's Hook, and this area here on Juma is definitely his now. But so what we saw, he's sneaking along here. He, he, uh, you can definitely hear the mating going on, and he's just keeping out of that, out of that sort of firing line. Uh, and they can often survive for a, a year or two after they've been displaced by being sneaky and sort of hanging around the peripheries of other males' territories, trying to avoid uh, the new dominant males. to be, get to see him again before he moves on to uh, the next realm. Uh, but uh, I think we, we probably will see him a few more times from this. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, animals tend to like to do that to prove you completely wrong. So I said, it looks, he, he doesn't look great, but he doesn't look horrific. So I think he'll probably hang around the peripheries and maybe sneak in and out of his old territory uh, for a while. So I think we're probably going to see him on and off for the next couple of months at least. wondering do we ever see black le or oh, black panthers which are actually leopards you're correct in that they're leopards right it's a menalistic uh, leopard and so basically the dark coloration it's a double recessive gene and that dark uh, coloration is taken over you can still see rosettes on them but they're just very faint uh, there are have been recorded cases in Leidenberg which is probably 250, no, maybe not that far, maybe 200 kilometers uh, as the crow flies from us. I have seen one uh, in my life. I was actually very young and dashed across the road in front of us in Zululand. Uh, and then I know in certain parts of the Congo Basin forests, uh, there are areas that have a high percentage of menalistic leopards. But I, I've never heard of one being recorded in the Sabi Sands. So with a recessive gene like that, what that means uh, is both the male and female has to carry that gene, and so it needs to be a double recessive, so they both have to carry that gene for it to, for it to be passed on. So normally, I'm trying to remember now, high school biology, how's the best way to describe this? So if you had a, a let's say a normal leopard, uh, that gene is a big L and a black leopard is a, is a little L. So most leopards would probably be two big L's in that little genetic code. Uh, but so to get a black leopard, you would need uh, 
two, oh, one big owl, one little owl, one big owl, one little owl. Uh, no, I'm incorrect. Andrew, help me out here. You did uh, biology at the university. One, one little owl, one big owl, then the other one can be both big owls or whichever one. To get, no, but to get the double recessive, if the double recessive is a little owl. So it'd have to be one big owl, three little owls. Yes. There we go. There we, we got there eventually. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, now he's just confused. Yeah. It's been a while since we did genetics. I studied biochemistry, but that was six yeah. years ago. Yes, yeah, there we are. Um, Andrew did biochemistry, but six years ago. So we just going to have a quick look. Where's this termite mark? Do you remember, Andrew? Should be here. There it is. See a quick look, see if Mr. Mbula is still sleeping on top of it. Okay, we're going to go, let, go to Jamie very quickly. And Tingana seems to be making her work for any kind of action. sound effects are incredible. There is nothing like that sound. She contentedly rolls onto her back. Now I know that it's quite soft for you. I've got a lapel mic on so we don't have the standard mic setup that we've had to or that we usually have on the vehicles. Now this afternoon's been a bit of a lesson in making a plan in order to bring you some of these incredible images. Tingana looking so unimpressed with life. <laughs> but yes, there's nothing like that sound. And that reflex that the female exhibits when she rolls onto her back is known as the lordosis reflex or part of the lordosis or the mating reflex. Something that happens completely instinctively in both big leopards and in lions. As I said, that sound effect is something quite spectacular. And I believe that Brent has challenged you. Oh, big yawn. Brent has challenged you all for your best mating leopard impression. Oh, I thought for a second there she was gonna go and try again. I was about to be very impressed with her stamina. Although I always am with mating leopards, it's incredible how frequently they can mate. And you can just imagine the amount of energy that they're burning through this whole process. But yes, please send us through your best mating leopard impression. Viam and I would love to continue. I actually did one at the start of drive, which I feel was fairly, fairly accurate. Although it might have looked rather silly. And Viam and myself won't be able to do it while we're sitting in the leopard sighting itself. We run the risk of either chasing them away or getting some very concerned looks from the other people who are in the sighting with us. And after that session, Tundi's now trying to catch flies that were bugging her. <laughs> she just can't quite get comfortable. And Chantal, while we've been looking at these two leopards, we've seen Tundi for the first time. But of course, it's not the first time for us seeing Tingana. And Chantal was wondering what the identifying marks of a Tingana are. One of the things that for me stands out particularly with him is that enormous dewlap or the flap of skin at the front of the throat. I always find that absolutely incredibly big on Tingana. All male leopards have it, but his is particularly large. Beyond that, each individual, <laughs> I think he just got a fright because his tail twitched. <laughs> I 
can hear an African black cuckoo whistling in the background. Supposedly saying, I was always taught I'm so sad, but it's now been changed in our live safaris to I'm so glad. And I'm certainly very, gla very glad that this is how this afternoon drive has played out. Two mating leopards, one we've never seen before. So Chantel, for me, that's the most identifying feature of Tingana, his big thick neck. But many of the viewers have their different ways and spot patterns that they identify him with. And at this point, actually, he's one of the, the males that we see the most frequently, although I'm very grateful that Mvula decided to put in an appearance for this afternoon as well. And you can get an idea of the comparison between the size of those two, with Mvula reaching at the end of his prime and Tingana slowly taking over, as I'm sure that Brent has discussed with you. And the flies appear to be plaguing these poor leopards. And Happy Cub, who is watching in Pennsylvania, you are wondering whether or not the female will stop mating as soon as she is impregnated. And to the best of my knowledge, no. She will continue right up until the end of her natural hormonal estrus cycle. And that is, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that each cub is an egg fertilized separately. They don't obviously came, come from the same, and they say genetic twins. They come from separate eggs. And what that means is, is that although one might be fertilized the one day, Another ovum could be fertilized the next, so she won't stop mating as soon as she is, or as soon as she is um, fertilized or impregnated. And also, it takes a while for, once the fertilization has happened, obviously the cells are all dividing, and they only really start secreting those hormone levels, or the progesterone, to keep the, make sure she keeps the lining of her uterus and builds it up for impartation. That only really happens generally after a couple of days. So for her, she'll just mate until the end of her estrus cycle, which is roughly between five to seven days, and then she'll move off. And of course as well, sperm have quite a long lifespan within a uterus, so you can look at even two to three days that they could still be viable within her. So it's entirely possible that she will, oh, it's not possible, sorry, she won't stop mating until she's reached the end of that natural hormonal balance. And you'll start to see it when they reach the end of that time period in their mating sessions. They start to become fewer, far between, and generally quite lazy, actually. And that aggressive swatting action that we see doesn't always actually happen. Now, the cats have gone to sleep again. And since it has been a leopard-themed afternoon, I believe that Brent is with Mbula. So, difficult to believe, but he is still there. Um, you can see how there seems to be a flat area in the grass. And when I look through my binoculars, I can actually just pick up the odd rosette. So he is still asleep on top of that termite mound. But unfortunately, not a great visual. But it has been an incredible sunset safari. Not much of a sunset to speak of this evening. But three leopards, three different leopards, two big males and a female leopard that none of us of the current Safari Live crew have ever seen before. So what an exciting, exciting day and always incredible to watch that amazing interaction uh, that you get with um, mating leopards. And uh, I'm very happy Jamie also got to go in there and see them since she did find them. Uh, so it is only fair, one would say. But uh, it has been incredible and we've really, 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 really lucky this afternoon. But hopefully they'll still be around in the morning. Uh, it'll be Scott and myself hot on the trail. And who knows, maybe then Kahumas will put in an appearance as well. But from Andrew and myself sitting here waiting for 
I'm ruled to move. I thought I saw a bit of movement there. Just a minute. And he just rolled over. I just caught a flash of white belly. Maybe we're heading off hunting. Maybe we'll see Mvula as well. So I said Mvula could be turning 13. Ellen Fowler says he's 11. Uh, he must be turning 12 then, Ellen. Uh, he's looking very old uh, for an 11 year old leopard. Uh, maybe he's been at the losing end of a few battles recently. So again, from uh, Andrew and myself, uh, it's been wonderful having you with us. Don't forget to join us on the Sunrise Safari. We'll be hot in pursuit of those mating leopards. Hopefully they're still here. Uh, maybe we'll see them for that as well. All the Inkahumas, you never know. That's the joy of being on safari. So for the last few minutes of drive, let's go spend some time with those mating leopards. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what an absolute pleasure indeed this afternoon has been. The amount of surprises and curveballs that it has thrown in our direction from starting off with that hippo that very kindly stopped us in our tracks and therefore gave us the very first hint that these leopards were hiding in the drainage line. After spending a whole morning tracking an animal, there is no better feeling of satisfaction than actually eventually finding them and spending a little bit of time with them. There's something about really having to work for these sightings that make them even more special. And Paul Rizzo, I'm glad you had a fantastic day. It's an absolute pleasure. And yes, certainly been incredibly lucky over the last few days. A little bit of luck and a little bit of intentionally attempting to be in the right place at the right time has also helped and of course these wonderful creatures make it so easy for us to be grateful every day for what they see i think she's going to go again good girl for our last few moments And as I said, the intricate dance of a leopard attempting to seduce a male. Awesome. She's thoroughly unimpressed with life. It's, a, it's such a fascinating process to watch. So much aggression and power within these incredible animals. Nope, gonna find yourself a comfy spot in the drainage line and grooves. And Iggy, you wanted to know, and for the rest of the audience, if this mating is successful, we can expect little tiny Tingana and Tundi babies, the double T's, in the next 90 or so days. So between 90 to 100 days, depending on the individual leopard, and as well as the season. How awesome was that? And Marilyn, it is an absolute pleasure. It was Marilyn's first time watching mating leopards, and I'm sure it was for many of the other viewers as well. What a special, special afternoon, and it is an incredible process to watch. Hopefully we'll be able to catch up with them tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari. You'll have to join us and find out. And as always, a big thank you to VM for camera work in this particular this afternoon under quite challenging conditions. <laughs> Resting his camera on my first aid kit, bumping around the back of the Mahindra looking, covering himself with a rain cover. It's been a very interesting afternoon, very, definitely very different, and that's what makes these live drives so much fun. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful afternoon and enjoyed it as much as I did, as well as a big thank you to the lovely ladies in FC and Eugene for all of his technical work. Join us tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari. It promises to be amazing. Cheers, guys. <laughs>